right, this is just going to be a brief overview of uh, the rules. I won't go into too many details, but I'm going to go ahead and try to cover just about everything that is uh, major. Um, so let's just kind of go over uh, what's going on here. You have the universe board. You have 15 planets. Um, this is your this is the wormhole, your player mat, and your matrix. Uh, this is your research goals. Um, these are used only in the category three quake, uh, kind of what we call our advanced game. Um, let's go over how you win. Uh, in Paradox, there is a past, a present, a future, and a Nexus card. Uh, there are four cards for each world, and there is only one copy of each card in the deck. Um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to collect sets uh, of these worlds in order to score points. The more cards that you have in a set, the more points you're going to have. If you have all four of I at the end of the game, you're going to get 10 points. Any combination of the three, you're going to get six. Any two is going to get you three. And any one card in a world is going to get you one point. Uh, in the category three quake, um, at the end of the game, you're also going to add uh, bonus points for uh, any of the research goals. So uh, you'll get one victory point for every present card that you have in your score pile. For every two alien uh, minerals that you have, uh, you'll get additional three points. And for every three alien artifacts, you'll get six points. So you see here this uh, present is going to help me score for the first research goal. And it also has an alien artifact, which is also going to help me score here. All right, with that aside, let's go into the phases of Paradox. There are three phases. There is the wormhole phase, is where you'll be drafting cards onto your player mat. So you'll be choosing the worlds that you want to save. Um, after everyone is drafted, you're going to go into the matrix phase, where you'll be spending action points to sw uh, swap discs around in order to generate energy to pay for uh, uh, these timeline cards. After the matrix phase, everyone is done their matrix phase, we go into the cleanup phase. Uh, cleanup phase involves um, all the cards in the unstable wormhole will go to the discard pile. All the cards in the stable wormhole will slide into the unstable. And then we refill uh, the unstable first and then fill in any holes that are down here in the unstable from the deck. Um, so let's kind of go through a little uh, uh, turn here. Um, we'll just go ahead and say this is like a four player game. And in a three and four player game, you're going to have a chief scientist. The chief scientist always gets four cards uh, from the top of the deck as their research hand. Uh, they get to look at these cards, um, but they do not go first. The chief actually goes last. So uh, the player to their left can take uh, one card from either of the, uh, of the wormholes and then place it on their time mat. So we'll go ahead and say player one here chooses the past of Dixel. Um, if you can see here, I'll go ahead and show you back here on these. As you can see, the future all require one of a specific resource. The present requires two of a specific resource. And all past cards require three of any type of resource. So it doesn't matter what color, you can mix and match. Uh, it just requires three resources. So we'll go ahead and say that player one takes the past, uh, player two, uh, let's see, takes a future, and player three wanted to go ahead and take this breakthrough card. And uh, what that's going to go ahead and give them is a plus one action on their turn. So instead of having two actions, they'll have three, or they can opt to take the secondary ability to allow them to blow up a row or a column uh, to help them kind of change their matrix around. Now let's go back to the chief. The chief has been looking at their research hand. The chief can take up to two cards from the wormhole. Uh, so they can take up to two cards or they can pass. If they pass from the wormhole, they must take one card from their research hand. Um, depending on which one they choose, it doesn't matter. But after they make that choice, 
the cards, the research hand goes back on top of the deck, and they will be the first cards that come out in the stable wormhole. So what that actually does is it gives them a little bit of a future sight to see what's coming up. So I can see that A's coming up, so maybe I want to grab this A before it leaves the unstable wormhole. So I can go ahead and take two cards, and I will go ahead and take A. Now when you take a card, depending on if it's past, present, or future, is where it is placed on your player mat. All futures go here, all present go here, all past and nexus cards go here. So I can go ahead and take a second card, and I will go ahead and take F here. Uh, Faraday, Nexus. Now how do Nexus work? Nexus work a little bit different than your timeline cards. They are going to give you a uh, token that you must place on the location of the grid. So I'm going to go ahead and place it here. And now what that does is that locks that chip down and in order for me to score Faraday before it falls off my board into Lost, I need to include it in a red match. Um, Okay, so after everybody, as after the chief is drafted, then play passes on to the matrix phase. The matrix, uh, the same thing, the chief goes last. So the player to the left is going to take their matrix phase, and then it's going to go all the way around, and the chief is going to go ahead and wrap up that round. Uh, so let's go ahead and explain what you do during the matrix phase. You have two actions. Uh, with an action, you can swap any two discs on the board as long as they have the same symbol. Uh, there are three symbols in the game. There is an X, there is a triangle, and there is a circle. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create time strands of four or five matching colors in a row or a column. So for example here, um, we can go, we, we need one yellow resource to save the future here of Alphoria. Uh, when you make a four time strand, you get one resource of that type. If you make a five time strand, you get two uh, resources or energy of that color. Um, so let's go ahead and see what I can finish here. I'm going to go ahead and just do, let's go ahead and swap, no, we're going to go this way. We're going to go ahead and make a yellow. So as soon as you make a four or a five, uh, it is removed from your matrix. When you make a four, you get one energy disc of that color. The rest go to your discard pile. Uh, you may use this energy to spend on timeline cards. So I'm going to go ahead and complete the future of Alphoria because it only needed one yellow. Uh, it goes to your score pile, uh, but you announce if it was a past, present, or future. Because every time that you complete a timeline, the quake marker is going to jump to a new planet. So I completed a future, so the quake marker is going to move five spaces. Past moves one, present moves three, future moves five. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, and we're going to land on J. When the quake lands on a stable planet, it becomes fractured. And you flip it over. Um, at the end of the game, any worlds, any, um, sorry, any timeline cards that I have in my score pile that are fractured in the um, training mission, you're going to lose one card from that set. So let's go back to I here. And if I was fractured, uh, and I had all four cards in I, which is worth 10 points, but it ends up being fractured at the end of the game, I lose a card bringing me down to six points. So in the training mission, the quake is not as uh, powerful, but you still want to go ahead and make sure that your worlds are safe at the end of the game so you can score the maximum points. Uh, in the category three quake, if I is fractured, you lose all the cards in that world. So it is uh, extremely important that you make sure that your worlds are safe by the end of the game. After you went ahead and spent your resource, because when you make a resource, you must spend it uh, immediately. If you have nowhere to spend it, it is just lost. You go ahead and all of your energy discs drop to the lowest row possible. You then go ahead and refill. Now the way that you refill is you refill the lowest row 
uh, possible first, left to right. So up here at the top, we're just going to go ahead and fill in left to right. Now I did that all in one action, so I still have another action. You always have use your actions with a full uh, matrix. So I look ahead and I want to go ahead and I want to try to save F, uh, but I also want to, let's go ahead and say I want to repair I. So let's talk about how we can repair the, um, the planets over here in, in the universe. Um, I'm going to go ahead and swap this red X with a white X and create a time strand of white. Now white or black can be spent on pass cards because they can take three of any. But white or black also have a secondary ability that makes them a very valuable resource. Since I made a four, I have one white resource. I may spend that one white resource to stabilize a fractured planet. Or I can put a shield. See, I've got a completed A here. I can put a shield on a planet that I've been collecting. You can put it on any planet that you want, but you're going to want to make sure your planets are safe at the end of the game. Now, the way shields work are, is whenever the quake comes around and lands on a planet with a shield, the shield is removed and the planet is safe until the next time it comes around. So you're constantly juggling trying to keep your planet safe by the end of the game while still trying to save uh, timeline cards. I went ahead and I took my second action and my matrix is going to drop. But if you remember, the nexus do not drop and they actually stay like they're pinned to the table and anything above them will stay there. So I need to go ahead and refill my matrix because I've taken my two actions. So I'll go ahead in here and dig in a bag. Now remember our rule, we always refill the lowest row first, then left and right. This is not uh, a strict rule, but this is just a rule to keep um, everyone honest so they're not placing pieces wherever they like. Now, I got a nice red here, so maybe later on my next turn, I'll be able to swap this and get that nexus. Now let's go over the end of your turn steps. At the end of the turn, any cards on your player mat slide one space to the right. Uh, any cards that fall off your player mat go to the discard pile um, and you basically just lose the time that you had spent working on it and lost any resources on it. Um, also at the end of your turn, you put all the discard back into the bag. After the chief has taken his uh, actions, we go ahead and we pass the chief marker to the next player. We move the turn marker and now we go ahead and take care of the cleanup phase. Any cards in the unstable wormhole go to the discard pile. Any cards in the unstable wormhole slide down. And then we always refill the stable wormhole first. So any of the cards that the chief scientists were looking at will be around for two turns. Oh, there's a nebula. So this gives me an opportunity to explain the anomaly. During the matrix phase, on your turn when you are using your actions, you may also swap with the anomaly. So later, if I uh, wanted to go ahead and swap with this anomaly, I would just spend my action to turn this triangle in for this triangle. And it's just like these three pieces here are on your board. Now that leads me into the nebula. When a nebula comes out of the deck, it goes on top of the anomaly and it cannot be accessed until the next turn. So during the cleanup phase is when you would remove the nebula uh, for, the for the next turn. So I'll go ahead and continue filling up the uh, unstable wormhole here. And basically what happens is we do this for 12 rounds, and at the end we go ahead and score our score piles up. Uh, remember that uh, uh, four cards in a set is 10, three is six, uh, any two is uh, three, and any single card in a world is worth one point. Uh, and if you are playing the category three, you'll go ahead and add your research goals. And that's pretty much a brief overview of how to play Paradox.